all those place parties at the Frankfurt Book Fair, but also to pay homage to somebody I've known for more than 26 years, and will always come and hear the lecture of this man, wherever it may be. Ron Heron draws like a dream, and is very gentle, and doesn't apparently get hassled or hustled. He's not aggressive. He's been teaching in this school, I think, continuously for something like 24 years. And he has maintained his optimism through a very, very long time indeed. The, the actual documentation of his life and his work has been made several times recently because of the publication of, of the building out of which he now works, which is in the next street. But I think there are one or two special characteristics, since this is not just, he, he was saying to me not very many minutes ago that he actually rates giving the lecture, and he gets more nervous, <laughs> dare I say it, publicly, he gets more nervous giving the lecture here in this place than almost anywhere else of, of, of dozens and hundreds of places that he, he's asked to lecture. Because in a way, the, the role played by the architect who teaches, or the teacher who designs, to you guys, whoever you may be, is a very special one. It's a very symbiotic relationship. And if you go around the corner and see the people who are sitting uh, on the computer terminals, or behind the drawing boards, both, uh, many of them, in fact, virtually all of them, are people who have a direct relationship with this place, i.e. he employs almost entirely AA students or ex-students. And it's a special relationship for anybody who does act as a professional, because one knows that the, the work that you do will be scrutinized in a very special, picky, cynical, love-hate kind of way by the people sitting here. Only a week ago, Ron Heron was facing many of you, uh, not as a distinguished lecturer and designer of buildings, but as uh, somebody putting his wares on the table for the punters. That is to say, somebody who is uh, inviting or not inviting people to take part in his unit. And that's, that's the sort of situation that hardly exists anywhere else, where however, however externally rated, in the end, it's a special relationship where there's surely somebody sitting out there who, however clever you think you are, is going to do something fucking sight cleverer the next day or the next decade. But for me, the specialness of Ron is, as I said before, that the, the ideas come trickling through his pen. The gentleness of his criticism but do not be deceived by that. Behind that apparent ease of response, behind that apparent gentleness of response, is, is a tremendous architectural mind. He was not as privileged as you are of having you know, the best teachers in the world and, and Uncle Tom Cobley and I all passing through his doors. He actually was sitting there at the back end of London reading books. And if you want to really have a discussion as to what is the difference between Vasily Lockhart and Hans Lockhart, what is the difference between early Mies and late Mies, what is the difference between Bruno Tart and Max Tart, and who is Fred Forbart? who is a real person, then you actually talk to Ron. In other words, what I'm really saying is behind this apparent ease, the apparent tremendous ease with which the building around the corner has reached the degree of sophistication and exactness that it has, is a tremendous architectural knowledge. And it should not be misunderstood, therefore, that though he has a very particular taste and straight line of development that has gone over the same 24 or more years since he's been teaching here. There is a tremendous cognizance of the body of architecture running behind it. I, I will be thinking about that when I listen to him this evening, and I think it's something which we are all rather shy 
of talking about, which is that in order to do the sort of architecture that hangs by a thread that bubbles over a, you know, this, this, this beautiful detailing, is a very, very close work through knowledge of 20th century architecture. Bronze is smashing to have you hidden. On the half of our Now I'm really nervous. <laughs> uh, my office, uh, I, I just get rid of that for a moment. My office, and apart from John Randall and myself, are entirely AA trained. Uh, I would not, probably would never employ someone not from the AA. And uh, I've had arguments about this. Uh, <laughs> Richard McCormack once, who said he'd never employ an AA man because they don't know anything, which is nonsense. And so, uh, I, in a way, I take absolutely the opposite. Well, I will only employ an AA man or, or do. Uh, John and I are not, John Randall, who's very important to my office, uh, and the job you see at Store Street owes a hell of a lot to him. Uh, he's one of those unsung guys, and uh, you should know him. He isn't AA either. He's from uh, Leicester, I think, uh, through Cedric and so on. I've known him many, 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 many years. Uh, a brilliant guy. And he and I, uh, AA by time, I guess, we've been in this building so long, we even think like you guys. Uh, I'm, I'm actually evening school at the Poly which was probably the way, this was when it was called the Regent Street Poly, um, which is before your time. The, the other thing that, just before we get going on the pictures, because I like to talk to pictures, um, I, I haven't reminded Peter on this, it's almost 25 years ago to the day when he and I, I think, I think if it was his first, it was certainly my first time standing up the front here, um, we talked about a thing called the Fulham Study, which I don't feature tonight, it's very old, and I think it was his first time here as well. And we were very nervous, and my mind's absolutely blank about this evening, other than being uh, uh, confronted by, by the AA, my first time in the building as well. Anyway, <laughs> since then I've sort of got used to it. What I'm going to do is um, take you through a few projects. I'm going to get rid of Store Street, the building around the corner, fairly quickly. It occurs right in the middle, um, because it, 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 in the end, it was a year and a half ago that we designed this, uh, and it was built over a year period. And there are four projects that I'm dying to show, two of which I'm not supposed to talk about, uh, that are current. And that I think, like most of us, you love talking about what you're doing than what you've done. Okay, if I can have some slides, that'd be great. Do I do this? Yes, it's the, the top right one. I haven't got the glasses, yeah. Eh? Yeah. Top. Yeah, just come up. Another sign of old age, eh? No glasses. And these two, two glasses. Should I take the last one? Yeah. These two? Yeah. Okay. okay. <coughs> Christine, on the way over here, said to me, you're not going to show that bloody slide again. Um, <laughs> the one on the left. <laughs> I, I, I always use this, I can't resist it. Uh, and any of you that are new to the place will bear with, uh, those that have heard it before, bear with me. I love robotics, uh, and I'm a, one of those guys of an age group that was brought up in science fiction comics. Uh, and the idea of, 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 a, of, of a robot that sort of wafts around and does things for you, really, I mean, I'd love one of these things. In, in the 60s, on the right, I did a thing, a robot called Manzac. I won't bore you with it, but that's Manzac, that little white job, used to float around with you and do anything you wanted. And there's a whole series of slides about that. But on the left, uh, the thing that Christine said not again, is uh, a guy, and I don't know his name, who invented this wall climbing machine. Uh, a 
and he's in the tradition of the English inventor. Uh, the amateur in his backyard invents the thing. He's no idea why, and he's no idea what to do with it, but he does it, and he plays with it, and he makes this thing. And it climbs more by six, says a suction pad. I'm not going to show it, which she was expecting, the next slide, which shows the Japanese company actually now selling these things to inspect buildings. But I, I, I guess I love the English amateur, uh, the, the amateur inventor. And in the end, we're all a bit like that, you see. I think I stand up here and I'm going to be saying a lot of things tonight about decisions I've made about buildings. But very often, the decision is, I like it. And I'll mention that as we go on. I, I can't explain. Mechanisms. I, uh, the thing on the left is a, a climbing machine. And what I like about this is the, the movement of, of this object, the, the building or the object that, that goes in uh, a series of, of moving sequences. And then those things reflect in my own work of, of looking for mechanisms in the building that twitch. I mean, my, my ideal, I would guess, would be a building that twitched continually. Tense. And, and I did this at the RIBA uh, in homage, really, called is, is on the left. I don't know if you know the, this uh, fabric structure of his. Um, I mean, it's very obvious, usually, to go to Fry Alto or, or some such person. Um, but, you know, Corb, uh, what, 40, 50, 60 years ago, even? 50 years ago, anyway, uh, was doing this fabric structure. The man has been everywhere and done it all. And so it, uh, this is in homage and, and the fabric structure of recent years of my office. Scaffolding. Uh, Hazel usually collects all my ha scaffoldings at Hazel Cook. Not this one, though, Hazel. Um, I went to the Acropolis. I love the idea of veiling things and of seeing things through layers. And I was standing on the Acropolis here with maybe 400 German uh, coach uh, tourists. Huh? And I was the only one facing that way. They were all looking the other way, where the scaffolding was. I love, that's the Erechtheum. For me, the Erechtheum, I can't even say, uh, is improved by the veiling. I, I like the idea of the fact that the thing is propped up. It's hundreds and hundreds of years old, and it's actually propped up, so why not? Right? And my own investigation of veiling and propping. And then I put two things in that, that are continual uh, uh, concerns of mine that go back to the 60s and archigram, of the building that is on the move on the right, uh, inflatable in this instance, fabric structures, things that come up and go down. Um, I, I do believe it's almost impossible to build a permanent building for anything. Um, and I enjoy the idea of buildings that are not permanent. On the left, a building that twitches. Uh, I discovered the Macintosh about five years ago. And I found that if you kept, if you drew something and kept moving the mouse, it kept repeating the image. So there's a sort of after image uh, uh, technique. Which I like drawing. I'm a very lazy draftsman, and the Macintosh is a, a fabulous thing because it, it just keeps repeating things, and you can move things around at ease. So if you hold on to those two images, you'll find that they continually crop up. The other. Uh, it was it was Martin Pauli. He wrote a thing about the Store Street building recently, and he said to me that you, me, and Peter had uh, done this all before the Store Street building, and uh, he was reminding me of projects of way back where we looked at covering uh, the space between buildings, and I dug out. 
uh, these uh, three sketches out of my sketchbook, uh, where what one was interested in was, uh, was the existing environment and how one might affect that by covering the space left between. So, to work, I'm showing about three projects prior to Store Street and then a series of projects that are current. This um, coincides uh, maybe three years ago in Frankfurt. This is the oldest scheme in, in, in this evening. It's uh, a project for a house that uh, twitches and moves and responds, uh, that you can drive bits of it out into the garden. Uh, it, it, it was a, one of those um, projects that we continually uh, put our minds uh, around, um, where nobody's asking you to do it, you just do it for yourself. And we find little bits of time in the office to progress these sorts of projects. So this is very early computer drawing uh, of ours, maybe four years ago. Of, of this project, and it goes through a series of phases. Most things uh, I like to think um, start in my sketchbook, but th it isn't true, because they often start in my son's sketchbook or somebody else's sketchbook, but it's a nice thing to think. This one did. Um, uh, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm always worry about these things, by the way. I mean, do you keep sketchbooks, they can we become very um, pretentious things if you're not careful and uh, I try deliberately to make them as casual as possible and I use them for shopping lists and so on so that it, it, it devalues them slightly but it, I, I'm, I'm a great believer in keeping your thinking um, uh, and again being a, a, a Corp fan uh, if you if you buy those amazing volumes of his, uh, you can't understand half of it, but more than mine. So I, I'm a great believer in keep. I enjoy drawing. I didn't do these two drawings. Um, they were done in my office. And uh, what I find now is often the only thing I'm doing with a, with a hard drawing is waving the airbrush at it because I'm the only one that knows how hard to push. Uh, the button on the gun. Um, the drawings in this case were done by boys in the office. Uh, we, what we were interested in here, the pink object at the back, uh, there's a house, a strip house, um, very simple proposition, a frame on about a, a 10 meter uh, grid, um, some objects that are fixed, like bathrooms, uh, a platform that's semi-fixed, uh, which is the yellow area, and walls that expand. I've always, I've spent all my life trying to find a wall that would act like a walrus balloon, i.e., we saw one this morning, uh, that you blow in and it stretches and you take the air out and it, it contracts. There is no such building material, but we need it desperately. And this was about that, about the house that twitches and moves. And where the back wall, the pink wall, um, which is maybe 15 meters long, six meters high, is drivable. It's a video wall that can uh, uh, capture the garden that is beyond it or can drive into the garden. Uh, there, there was, we very pedantically drew every axonometric you could think of here to uh, talk about this. I think. Um, um, we were talking about, we had a jury this morning, our first jury of the year, um, which was a very exciting morning, very interesting, uh, and a lot of lovely things. But, um, and, and I want to encourage uh, students to draw. This is how you talk about what you're thinking about. And uh, it, it is ridiculous. We have one guy, and I'm going to shame him, I'm not going to mention him by name, who didn't do anything. That, I think that's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> uh, computer model, we're heavily into this. I'll try not to bore you. Um, I'm not a user. I'm the slowest guy in the office. I've spent years in my office being the fastest guy on the drawing board. 30 years. No one could draw faster than me, or airbrush faster than me, or mask faster than me. And suddenly we're 
into computing, and I'm the slowest guy in the office, so slow, I'm embarrassing. So I now take the machine home and practice. I'm going to get faster if I can. But we, we, we now work very heavily um, with the computer as a modeling tool. Um, we try and make the model of a project very early on. Uh, it's like working with balsa wood. It, it, it's amazing where you can keep making and making and making. Uh, and, and for someone like me who loves to leave things right to the last minute, um, it, it, is, it, it is a dream because you can change your mind right at the last minute. I understand. Uh, and this uh, particular model does things that you, it, it would be very difficult to draw, sort of transparent surfaces and that sort of thing. Uh, I don't think the house is that, that interesting, but the, I think the use of the computer on this was particularly interesting. <laughs> Fabric structures, we, we've spent um, many years working with, with fabric structures. Um, uh, very rarely building them, I might add, uh, but, but, but you get a reputation. If someone uh, is looking at something that moves, they usually ask Cedric and I to do something, and I find often secretly he and I are competing because nobody's told us. Uh, and we often find ourselves in that position. Um, um, and neither of us has built very many <laughs> fabric structures. It's amazing how you can build a reputation by drawing, by the way. Uh, a fabric structure for British telecoms um, on the right, on the globe site. Um, it, it was a very amusing story, this one. We, there is a very light version of this uh, that was made, first of all, and the client, who is, is British Telecoms, um, said that they felt it looked too much like a tent and that they were a bit worried that the Daily Mirror, they could see the sun and the Daily Mirror saying, BT Circus comes to town. <laughs> and so they said to me, can't you make it look more like a building? And so I had to, we, we worked with Hapholtz on this, and we had the twist uh, in Little, Little's arm at Hapholtz to sort of make the thing look more like a building. We had to go for a frame and inevitably all this slung stuff and so on. And so it wasn't quite what was meant, but it's how you often, I think as students, uh, it, it, you, you live in a marvellous world of, of uh, and you don't realise it. I mean, you, you're in a marvellous situation, but you can do what you like. You've only got to satisfy people like me. But in the real world out there, there are morons about I tell you. <laughs> and, uh, and very rarely do you get to do the sorts of things you you want to do. And we're all very selfish at the end of the day. We're, you know, those community architect guys, in the end, do it for themselves. So. Um, and we were, uh, we pushed this project around quite a bit. It, the vision for the future is a bit of a joke, of course, but uh, uh, it, it's taking today's technology. And often you find that people call you a, a high-tech architect. I'm a straight modernist. Uh, there is nothing on, that you'll see this evening that's particularly high-tech. I think Bucky once said, if it's truly high-tech, it's magic. I believe that as well. This is that same uh, tented structure. Um, I won't bore you with it, because you see these things in every, every magazine. The, but the, the magic of it was that it went up and down in seven days. Um, and that was the, the, the program, i.e. I want this space that's 2,000 square meters to contain an exhibition that needs uh, 12 meters of high space as well. And I want it up and down in seven days. I want toilets, I want to heat it, I want to light it, I want to carry the power, and that's where you end up, in almost inevitably. And it, it's, uh, we've been through this uh, many times, and uh, we've, we've yet to build one of them that size. Uh, interesting um, proposition, I think. 
of, of a very uh, inevitably very almost mesial uh, building as well. I, uh, there's not a lot of choice once you start putting a seven day limit on something. <coughs> We, we then modeled that, this uh, was exciting. Um, this shows, uh, this is uh, electronic collage. This uh, took the model of the BT building and put it on the shopping center site off the Edgewell Road on a wet Thursday afternoon. Um, and we've collaged the cars. And you can see on the right, the guy in the office that did the collage I thought, well, it's electric, electronic, he can't go wrong, but he's got the people on the pavement on the far side too big, eh? Um, and he could have squashed it. it. The beauty of the electronic collar, I don't know if you've ever tried collage, you spend hours going through thousands of magazines and cutting things out that don't quite fit, uh, and then try changing the drawing to make the people fit the drawing and all that. Um, but with the electronic collage, you can play with the people, you can shrink them, stretch them, fatten them, and so on. Um, so it means you can put the building in the real situation. Then I met the, the people at Store Street, the, this client who uh, made the Store Street building for, and who I'm now part of. And we looked at a project, a series of projects, and, and again, I won't uh, spend too long on them, but this is in, uh, would you believe, five years ago on Canary Wharf. And we, my client made the biggest mistake in his life. He didn't take the site. He was sitting right in the middle of the current development, which would now be worth fortune, even if he hadn't have touched it. But uh, it, we, he was interested in buying an old banana warehouse on the on Canary Wharf, um, taking down the building uh, and using the foundations of the building on Canary Wharf and building this new structure that would contain video studios, film studios, sound studios, and uh, uh, TV um, studio, um, real-time TV studio. So I, this started me off on uh, um, um, my now partner, who was uh, then my client, swears I made, um, uh, I made a living on them for the next five years, which I did. And I did a project every year almost for these people. Um, uh, this is on the uh, Camden Goods Yard side, and the round on the left, the drawing on the left, at the bottom there is the roundhouse. So it was all that site locked in by Havistock Hill, uh, Camden uh, Lock, and the canal, and the railway, about 15 acres of site. Um, we uh, and, and my current partner put together a proposition that was really exactly like 20th Century Fox Studios, but more so. It was a, a, a absolutely dream job for me because we were growing the buildings and we were going to use what were existing engine sheds, uh, which at the, at the bottom end, top end of the right hand drawing, and take a back lot out of that that was just a gantry where you could grow the buildings to make movies. Um, then the uh, candle put a compulsory purchase order on the site, so we, we lost interest. Then we looked at, would you believe, the biggest, one of the biggest architectural monstrosities in this country, I think, which is the Marco Polo development of Battersea, um, where the Observer building is. And we were offered the, the space next to the Observer, and we, we had a, quite an interesting proposition here for a series of towers in a four-story space that they hadn't quite built. And so we told them to stop uh, building and we were going to build these little, a sort of mini Manhattan in, in this four-story internal space. And then that died to death as well. He put, I think, what's his name? Uh, that man, Pollard, I think, uh, put the rent up and we backed off. At the same time, I was looking at robots for this same client 
and we were talking about a, a, a frame, a robotic frame uh, that moved on air pads that could be dressed on the right uh, 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 for events and so on. And this is a thing that we still talk about. One, one day we're going to make this object that we can wheel around the place, maybe four or five stories high, that will affect the building we're in. And here we are. This is uh, Store Street. On the left is a slide taken on the 11th of August last year. Um, but before we started building, the company I'm now with made a, a 10th anniversary party on the roof uh, at one night. And we started building demolition the next day. And it was quite a party. But that's the building we're, we're now dealing with. On the right is uh, in course of construction about nine months ago in, in the space between two buildings. Um, the proposition um, was fairly simple and the, the, I think the answer is a very simple, a fairly obvious thing to have done. There are two buildings that run parallel to one another and originally there was a link block through the middle that was some toilets and the buildings were made um, 1904 somewhere like that so fairly um, apparently substantial uh, edwardian buildings um, well, because once you start to tinker with them you discover that they're not quite as substantial as you thought but the proposition was to take these two parallel blocks for a single client and, and uh, initially um, cover the two courtyards that were left between the buildings um, and, and initially in a glass structure um, which proved to be very expensive and very difficult. The, the, these two buildings are not parallel, they splay away, there are different levels, floor levels are different. So the, the, the problems of trying to glaze in this space were tremendous um, and it occurred to me you needed a sort of dressmaking type answer to it and if you think about it fabric works like that it, it's pure dressmaking you can shape it very easily uh, to fit a space and so we decided um, with the clients backing to wrap this building in a rather crystal like way of, of running fabric over the roof the back roof and down the sides and I remember at the time suggesting to him this was going to be a battle um, that uh, in the end we're going to have to fight the planners we're going to have to fight the district surveyor and it has proved to be so um, there was one moment about six months ago when the district surveyor turned down the roof and it was halfway up huh? which was slightly nerve-wracking and, and we were committed to a lot of money. But uh, I discovered, like you do, um, being um, not a hundred-man office, you don't always know what you're supposed to do in these situations. And when I was a lad, you used to apply for a waiver. And so you say to the, the DSR, apply for a waiver, he says, what are you talking about? There's no such thing. And you discover that the DOE have a, a, a way around it. You can apply for a thing called, would you believe, a determination. So the DOE tell the DS, you're wrong now, you can do this. And so we put a package together that, that covered how fabric doesn't burn, uh, how uh, the space was really a courtyard anyway. Um, why would you worry about such a thing? And we, we won the fight. But uh, here we are with the district surveyor, a very nice man, um, an engineer, in case I have to deal with him again, uh, an engineer, I would guess, by training. And he said to me, uh, well, well, Mr. Aaron, well, um, this is not in the existing document. Show me where it talks about fabric. You see, the existing documents talk about concrete, steel, glass, resistance he said well it doesn't mention fabric so I said well no it doesn't mention it but we, we could prove to him that the fabric worked very well over this space and he said to me but it'll burn I said yeah but 
wants it bad and it's gone. And he could not get his, eye, his mind around this, i.e., if you put a flame to the fabric, it makes a hole. That it doesn't drip stuff all over the place, it just goes. So I hear you've got the space that's not there. <laughs> now that, this poor man wouldn't buy this, of course. <laughs> and he quietly said to me, you don't think I'm going to put my name to this and have everybody say, if Salmon's approved it, you see. And he was frightened that every DS in the country would blame him for a proliferation of fabric covered courtyards, I think. So that, that was all exciting, nerve-wracking, fingernail-biting stuff. Uh, 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 the model on the right, another computer model, uh, shows the crescent at the front next to the building center. The space through the center of the courtyards, and then there's a, another building beyond, which is a fairly straightforward open plan building. Lights, uh, oh, I'm going backwards, sorry. Mm -hmm. Like so. So that, that's the section. Um, it, it, it was very fortunate. These things often, uh, a lot of interesting projects, often demand a little lucky break. And the, on this uh, project, the building at the back, Store Street's on the left here, uh, at the back, um, was one story lower. So we could float this um, structure over the two spaces, the courtyard and this back roof to make a gallery. Uh, and on the right is a, a section of that gallery space. And so there's a simple steel structure that runs across the top at a fairly regular interval. And then we have uh, cables that uh, span in cross formation between the structure. And then we have these things we call uh, umbrellas, which uh, the engineer calls something else out here. Um, that, that push the, the fabric up and then it's tensioned so much so that you can actually walk on the fabric. Um, so that, and then we make connections across uh, the center space between the two buildings so that you can have departments and so on that span across and there's a continual almost Wellsian-like movement across the central space. Uh, of, of people moving backwards and forwards between the, uh, three layers of bridges. Um, on the left, um, very early on, we took the building, uh, we looked at the building in December. That drawing is dated January. Uh, on the right, um, the computer model that was made maybe in February, and eventually you'll see the final result, which is very similar. This is the top gallery roof. Again, my sketch about the same day here, yeah, January, on the right. There, there are differences, but they're fairly subtle that I won't bother to explain. And the computer model on the left, and the electronic collage. Um, these, these are f more recent models, and um, with the Macintosh, we've been desperately trying to draw soft structures with the Macintosh, and it, it is very difficult. Um, but that, uh, as it were, um, extracts the fabric structure. In the end, we lost the battle of taking the fabric down the side walls. I, I had to give in to the DS there, otherwise we'd have made it another three months for an approval. Um, the rather nice, uh, uh, model on the left from Happold's uh, computer who have an amazing machine that will make the cutting pattern. Uh, and they uh, can compute the stresses in the fabric and the shape and, uh, and cutting pattern for the fabric uh, on the machine. On the right, a computer image of ours that shows the, uh, as it were, the push-up and the, the, its umbrella top. Um, in the minute, yeah, here, on the right, the real thing, on the left, our computer model, uh, almost exactly the same uh, view. Uh, the computer we used here to, to design the joint, and it, it, it's quite remarkably like the final thing. Um, the production drawing on the right of the bridge 
there's I forget, 12 bridges across the space and the Macintosh, uh, friendly old Macintosh on the left. Uh, likewise, these are the bridges uh, crossing the space, looking up at the fabric, the yellow being the fabric. Then some construction shots. I don't remember where the, when these were, but uh, I would guess around Easter, um, when the, uh, the, the building contract took uh, exactly 52 weeks, um, and there was something like, I forget, three, three months of demolition. You wouldn't believe what rubbish comes out of the building. And so this is the roof structure in, uh, in process. Um, and the bundle on the left on the ground is the roof, the fabric. It's rather nice, it just comes as a roll of stuff and it gets lifted on and you roll it out just like making a dress. And it, the roof is 40 meters long in two strips, eight meters wide, and it comes in two pieces and you just roll it. Took a day to put up. Uh, this is it going up before tensioning on the left, so the umbrellas are not in position, so just sagging there, hanging. And then on the right, tensioned. And remember, once it's tensioned, you can walk on it. And it, it has a it, it has a quality uh, which is quite extraordinary. I mean, it, it, we've drawn these things over and over and over and over, and we model, but the the. Um, the fabric is, is rather odd because it's sort of there and not there. Uh, uh, in the daytime, funnily enough, it's less there, and <laughs> if, if you can imagine this, than it is in the evening. In the day, there's such a glow of light through it that it, 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 it's, um, it sort of hangs in the space. But at night, when it's dark outside and the light is hitting it from inside, it becomes quite solid um, and, and, uh, and quite different. And so you, we notice that uh, in living in the building that this, uh, this material is quite extraordinary. It changes uh, character through the day. Um, little details. This is uh, on the left from Bedford Square. We have to prove to the planning officer that it didn't intrude in the square, by the way. We cheated slightly. We, we, uh, lower the eye level, I think, a uh, little. But it does pop over. I don't think it does too much harm to the square. And on the right, some of the details that one gets involved in. Um, I think uh, the interesting thing uh, from your point of view is that if you were to see this, the, the detailing steelwork is immaculate. And it is immaculate because John Randall worried it out. In fact, if you talk to the Happolds, they had very little to do with detail. What they did was check sizes, but John detailed every joint. And you only get a sort of quality product in our business if you worry about it. If you leave it to anybody else, it gets cracked up. This is the inner space. Um, uh, it's difficult to tell. I think it's uh, an evening shot. Uh, the, uh, no, it can't be because there's daylight through the thing. This is uh, the center space looking more or less along the uh, axis of it with the various bridges that cross it. And on the right, fairly high up, looking out through the screen at the back, almost up the back uh, alley here into the um, back terrace of, of uh, the AA. And you're seeing there the fabric wrapping over the back. Um, I've got some video of this latest that, that you, you can see. These are the sexy shots. Eh? <laughs> Simon spent half his life in the last few months in this back alley. We've got it with the moon on the top, the sun rising, the sky is red, the sky is blue, beautiful. It's my, it, it, I reckon it's the, the, uh, the be uh, most beautiful photo I can imagine of the building. Very soft and sensual, shining and temporary. With a bit of luck, it won't be there in 20 years. Look at that, wow. 
Then, just over the last year, this was exactly a year ago, um, this was a, a, just a series of projects that are really current. This one's not any longer current, but was. They just said that was walking, but it's not current. <laughs> limited competitions they have in Germany. Do you know Karlsruhe? That's a beautiful little town. Um, one of those classic towns built on a radial pattern with a palace uh, in the centre of the radial um, that was bombed quite badly on the eastern side during the war. Um, L'Oreal, who are the uh, hairdressing company, wanted to, to uh, build a new headquarters on this side which was on, a, on the site of, of, uh, of the area that had been badly bombed during the Second World War, and where the German planners, who must have been out of their minds, actually broke the regimentation of this amazing grid and put a road in that went absolutely straight through the middle of it all. Um, I, I'm sure there would be a very good practical reason for it, but it killed what was a very elegant uh, plan. And we were given the site that was left uh, to uh, put the um, Lorient headquarters up. And Simon and I worked on this. We, we spent a couple of days there. And it became very obvious to us that the site on the left, on the drawings on the left, um, which was bounded by a series of roads, actually occupied a space that included the roads. It's a fairly obvious thing. I mean, if you put something in the middle of Leicester Square, uh, yeah, in the middle of Leicester Square, it actually occupies the space of the whole square, uh, not its site. And so we wanted to take advantage of this, and it, it did so happen. Um, and uh, I don't know how much we pushed this, but it, we were absolutely convinced that the program lent itself to three um, rather stubby towers on the side. Um, and we invented a fourth tower, which was we called the children's tower. We were asked to provide something for the local community. And so we made this little baby tower. And so the, these four towers did a sort of dance, as it were, in the big space. Um, formed by the uh, existing buildings. So they were study drawings, um, and that on the right is more or less, that was the competition entry, where these four rather plump um, towers uh, sat with a sort of um, rather rounded um, belly-like back, if you could imagine such a thing, and a, a glass, um, leaning out facade over a central space, uh, like so. Very um, expressionistic. I think it, 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 this is quite interesting for me. Th this is uh, um, me being influenced by my son uh, very strongly. Um, he was with Peter in his fifth year here. And there was a project uh, that he did with Peter that has a great deal of uh, resemblance to that. Um, and uh, I've quite enjoyed this. And we, we, we keep going back to these forms, this rather soft form. I think at heart, I'm an expressionist, really. Uh, early computer model of the four little towers with the top right, um, the tower, for the children. And the little quotes, top left of shading, armadillo-like armadillo cladding and layering that uh, fascinated us. Ship-like construction. We were using stretch form metal over the rounded surfaces, so they weren't sort of rusty like you might see on a hull of a ship. They were precise and shiny like you might see on an aircraft. Uh, stretch form, um, some sketches, and uh, the baby tower in the foreground on the right, and the other towers behind. 
uh, competition drawing, competition model, a very beautiful model made by Alex, um, one of our current students, uh, brilliant model maker. And it was cold cast in aluminium, which was absolutely superb. Um, and we really treasured this thing and we sent it off. Um, uh, by the way, we didn't win the competition. They, they bought the drawings, but not, we got a prize, but they selected a German, um, unusually in Germany, uh, to win the thing. And um, we, we were dearly wanting to get this back. We have a, an exhibition at the Heinz at the moment. And I wanted to show this because it, it's an absolutely superb cold cast model. <coughs> and L'Oreal said, yes, you can have it back, but only two please. And they posted it. <coughs> <in Japan. coughs> and they posted it. And it arrived in about a thousand pieces. So it no longer exists. But there, there's a very good computer model of her. Um, and uh, the, the computer's marvelous. This was very early on. We always use the machine to model straight on. Directly, there's something that looks interesting. We start the model. And it, 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 it is just like using boss wood. You can keep adding to it and subtracting. It's an amazing tool. Amazing images you get out of it. This is from some of the bridges that connect the, the buildings. It, it, it's they're rather weird. I mean, you can get slightly taken in, I think. We often talk about this at, at our juries, where one or two students are working in this way. Um, it's very d easy to get taken in by the complexity that uh, exists in those drawings. But uh, at the same time, that drawing on the left is quite a knockout, isn't it? I mean, it's a sort of accidental night shot and that often these things do happen accidentally, um, which is the, the, the little wharfs of towers in the, this public space. And uh, two images from slightly different viewpoints in a very similar area, looking right through the center at the side. Um, we we uh, never use these drawings to um, as a sort of underlay to draw over. I, I think that's crazy. I think the beauty of the computer is that it allows you to keep playing, and uh, they're not drawings, and uh, I think that's one of the things you have to get used to. But, I mean, trying to get those things on paper is the most difficult thing in the world. This is a very current project um, for a theme park um, in Europe. Um, early sketches. Um, the, the, quite an interesting structure, not like that, um, a very bad drawing. It's a cable net, so it's a solid roof um, and a tower. It's uh, something like 50 hectares uh, in size. So it's, it's our first, uh, not my first, but the office's first uh, um, move into very, very large scale. Um, it, it's about the size of the center of Milton Keynes. Uh, it's changed since here. It's no longer quite like this. It's no longer purely theme park either. It's taking on town-like characteristics of people living there. This is through the climb. And I've convinced them that uh, we uh, will make the master plan of this and that we will use European architects to make a lot of the buildings. So I'm looking forward to this, because all my mates are going to get a little piece of it. <laughs> uh, a computer image of that, uh, of a sort of isolated piece. It stands in a forest. I can't tell you too much about that. Uh, unfortunately, I've got four schemes now, and two of them are, are really I shouldn't be talking about. You can't resist it. Three weeks' work here, so it's very much in process um, building. And very large. Uh, the, the tower, by the way, was something like 300 meters high. The, the enclosure is quite strong. The cable net, in part, is 50 meters. It's cathedral like. Uh, little one, this is a nice little one. This is Simon. Um, little um, uh, fabric.
infrastructure for the BBC, BBC North East. Um, and they wanted a little exhibition building for the Gateshead Festival next year uh, that would have a little uh, radio um, studio in it and an exhibition space and a shop and so on. So these are the first sketches. Um, this was the first look at it, which was a, the drum on the left was the studio. There was a sort of bridge that connected it and a series of pavilions that came off the bridge and a ramp. It, it was <laughs> terrific chord overtones here. He, Simon and I are great chord fans. So. And, and then this uh, rather light dancing structure through the center that just kept the weather off. This, uh, it, it was quite an interesting program because one of the things they wanted us to do was design this thing for the Gateshead Festival. But when it was over, they wanted to take it to their Newcastle studios, BBC, and attach it to the existing building as an as a out, outside um, temporary studio. And, and so half the problems at this stage was trying to attach it back to the existing building. So you got, we got into terrible um, contortions trying to design something that could answer to quite different briefs. Um, and it, it got quite a long way up the road. We, we'd got preliminary uh, production drawings and costings and then they decided it didn't have to move to Newcastle, but it had to travel every year, and that they only had half as much money as they said they had. And so we ended up with this little chap, um, which again is uh, a shop that uh, there are a couple of portable buildings that they were going to drive in, and then a, a very uh, elegant little tent in the middle that was the exhibition space come studio. And it is quite interesting. I, I, it wasn't what I would have done. I mean, I, at the time, I was very unsure about bringing the fabric so close. I like I like tents to look like tents. <coughs> I, they've got edges and so on. They float. Um, but uh, the practical way of dealing with it was to take the fabric to the ground, like a Boy Scout tent. <coughs> and Simon was all for this, and he pushed me into doing it, and I think it was quite a successful idea. Computer drawings of that, um, we, we still had terrible trouble trying to fabric wrap things with our Macintosh, but we're getting there. That's so uh, slightly magical things, aren't they? Could you wish you could build something like that? Uh, amazing drawing on the left, it, it even looks like fabric and the model on the right. A uh, very difficult thing to draw and model. We, we, they nearly threw this out. They said it was too sexy. <laughs> this, this was a very straight man from the BBC. <laughs> he was very nervous of showing this to his committee. <laughs> and Simon and I quite innocently said, what do you mean? Didn't we? <laughs> Anyway, we convinced them it wasn't meant that way. <laughs> now we're in Covent Garden. This is uh, for next summer. Um, we're we're f roofing in the piazza in front of St Paul's Church, and we're taking a fabric structure over the church so that the uh, portico becomes a sort of stage. This is for the Arts Festival next year. So on the drawing on the right, well, you can read um, St. Paul's Church and, uh, and the market. And then the fabric will wrap over. The church tucks in, um, so it's untouched. We're just going to bridge it uh, with a cable um, and use the portico as part of the stage for a four-week um, season, like so. Um, one of the problems that was quite interesting, if you're putting something down, particularly in a place like this, uh, you have to be careful uh, on, on what you've found it on. So we've made a, a steel frame, that this is the hard line stuff on the left, so it sits like a, like a sort of um, four, uh, eight-legged 
animal on the sand, the fabric is then draped over. So you, you don't touch the ground or the existing buildings. And it sails across like so, that's inside. Um, model on the right. Like so, this is the frame before fabric. trouble with computerized. We've got thousands of these and it's difficult to choose. Huh? Um, I like the idea of this. I, I love the idea of putting something down and you blink and it's gone. It's a pity a lot of that more architecture is not like that. Very difficult to draw people on the computer. <laughs> Then our current project, the most current project, which is an airport terminal, not in this country, can't tell you where. <laughs> um, and it's very new, we've been now working on this three weeks, four weeks ma max. Uh, interesting, because we're building in the country where we were, our brief was it has to be in concrete. Now we, we're not concrete people, which is quite interesting. And Simon and I have gone back to our corp and looked at Chandigarh and all that and all that. And uh, we're trying to invent our way out of this. So I think it's going to be quite interesting for us. And we've been working in steel for and aluminium and fabric for so long. And this is big. I mean, it's, uh, I think, 50,000 square meters, huge uh, terminal. Um, fortunately, the client also wants us to affect all the airport buildings. So we're setting the scene for everything from hangars to control tower to fire station and so on. And these are the first sketches, uh, a model. The, the thing at the back is not another building, it's a hill. The computer has trouble drawing a hill. <laughs> and it's a terraced hill that will be occupied by housing. Um, so it's quite interesting that the roof of the buildings become a fifth elevation, i.e. they're as important as the, any other part of it. And so we're very concerned on this top surface. The runway and all the buildings are on reclaimed land and are surrounded by water, and it's not in Hong Kong. Uh, the roof on the left, uh, we're, we're looking at the structure that um, it, it, it is concrete, it is concave uh, in section. Um, it has center columns on the right. This is right through the center and it's on a curve. Um, the client uh, gave us the footprint, as it were, for the building, so we have to work within this. And, and so the, the, there's a curve in its plan and we've made a curve in its section in both directions. And so the, the sort of wing-like roof um, sits on uh, very few columns uh, and has a structural depth, would you believe, that the engineer, we're working with uh, not, uh, not our usual Hapold or Franklin Lee or Peter Rice, but a, an in-house um, engineer that works for the airport. And, uh, he said to us, this structure is going to be five or six meters deep because of this span. And we said, fine. And this guy nearly threw a fit. He could not believe it. He thought it, we want to put a thousand columns in. So it became like Karnak. <laughs> um, there is, this is the first sketches of the um, control tower and the computer model. Um, um, we're using similar forms right the way through, uh, uh, again concrete primarily, and trying to grow it out of the ground in, in a sort of sea wall like base. Uh, there's a fire station through the center of these two blocks. Like so. So it's a huge, huge thing. The, uh, on the drawing on the right, the green blob at the bottom is the, uh, air t uh, is the control tower. And you can see it as aircraft. Uh, Anthony spent hours modeling the aircraft so we could get some scale to the computer model. 
Thank you. 